So how does one prepare for a message worth spreading? I asked my 13-year-old son, Anthony, and when I said, white men can't run, where is the scientific evidence? He said, You can't say that, they're going to kill you. What? Because white men can run, but black men are just better. <laughs> Please don't kill me. So where does he get the strong belief? Maybe shared by some of you. I would say from facts like these. What you see here is the world records from the 100 meters to the marathon in men. And in the last 15 years, I've been updating the same slide. The only change are typically the name of the individual and that they run a little bit faster. The last column, this one here, in, indicated in red, remains the same, Africa. So what is going on? And in particular, for the shorter events, we're referring to West Africa, and for the longer events, it's either East Africa or North Africa. And this question has really been of interest to many, the media especially, and so what we decided to do back in 2004 is to create a virtual research center, I believe in collaboration. So I invited the best minds interested in this area and said, let's try and resolve this. And I invited them to a consensus meeting. And at the consensus meeting, here's a summary of the main opinions. And I will go through some of these today starting off with superior genetics. And I'll clearly talk a little bit about that. The solid foundation built over many years of running to school. And I'll really stress that one. The next one is socioeconomic factors and cultural factors. For example, getting out of poverty, having role models. An interesting cultural issue was running maybe 100 kilometers or 100 miles to another tribal area, stealing your wife, and running back. <laughs> you laugh, but actually the idea was survival of the fittest. Those who survived stealing your future wife were the better athletes, had better physical prowess. That was the idea. Other issues, high altitude, altitude training, you'll see in what I present to you that the common denominator in East Africa is being at altitude. And finally, the African diet. There, what we found subsequently as well, is that these athletes, the African diet typically, and what these athletes eat, is very, very high in carbs. Some 70% carbohydrate, not because of the training diet, it's actually the African rural diet. So I'm going to start off with genetics, because that is what my main interest was. And we knew from the brilliant work going back in the 1860s from Sir Francis Galton that when you look at nature versus nurture, he was the first to say nature is more important than nurture, especially when it relates to physical performance and maybe mental performance. But it was actually the father of exercise physiology, Professor for Olaf Astrand, who died recently, who quoted, who's, who's, who's responsible for this quote that we've often seen. To become an Olympic athlete, choose your parents well. So clearly I was interested in this component, and so I decided back in the early 2000s to pick up my rucksack, as you can see here, and, and with some of my students, go out first to Ethiopia a few times, then to Kenya, in this little bag, I had all these swabs, cotton uh, bud swabs, and these little tubes with alcohol in it. And I was trying to get the consent of these wonderful athletes, some of my heroes, to give me a little bit of spit, or saliva, whichever word you want to use. And we were quite successful in doing that. And what we were thinking we were going to find, the hypothesis was that these athletes were would, have a, would be from a similar genetic pool. They would be very, very similar between them and, say, if between each other compared to other populations. And that's what we thought we would find. But did we find that? Well, this, we've published a number of papers on this, and I'm not going to bore you with the science of that, but this t text from the International Olympic Committee Encyclopedia of Sports Medicine, I think, nicely summarizes all this year's work. And what do we say? 
But genetic studies of the Kenyans and Ethiopians, and actually also the Jamaicans, and I've got time to talk about that much today, these two athletes do not present, do not, do not uh, have a unique genetic makeup. Rather, they have a high degree of genetic diversity. Now, what does that mean? A simplified version of it is, there's no evidence of, sup of superior genetics. So if that is the case, that, that, that we can't explain this down to superior genetics, because if I went through all the papers, I'd say, no, we couldn't find this, couldn't find, couldn't find that. So if it's not genetics, what can it be? In doing these studies, what we found, typical in the morning, the rush hour, oops, the rush hour in particular, as you can see here, is this issue of running to school. As far as the eye can see, what you see are these kids running to school. And this particular photograph that I just showed you was from this region from Kenya called the Nandi region, highlighted here in this red circle. And this particular area is known for the Nandi running tribe, or known as the Nandi running tribe. The Nandi are the sub-tribe of the Kalenjin group, or the Kalenjin tribe. And since the mid-60s, almost every, if not every Olympic team that Kenya has sent to the Olympics has been made up of predominantly Kalenjin or Nandi, hence the Nandi or the Kalenjin running tribe, and with remarkable, spectacular results. In Ethiopia, we find something similar. If you look at the areas where the athletes come from, predominantly one area, and that's the area of Arasi. And those little triangles that you see on the slide indicate moderate to high altitude. I should have mentioned in Kenya, the same applied. The Nandi area is an area of moderate to high altitude ranging from maybe 2,000 meters to about 3,000, just over 3,000 meters. Like in Kenya, where we have the Nandi running tribe, in Ethiopia, we had the Oromo. And this particular area, the Arsi region, accounts for 5% of the population of Ethiopia, but 40% of the athletes. Some famous athletes, like Kenanisa Bekile, the Dababa sisters, Dirat Tulu, and I can go on and go on and go on, but I won't. And again, you see something similar. You see these kids running to school. You'll note the book under the arm being chased down by a horse. <laughs> but that slide I showed you epitomizes this great athlete, arguably the greatest distance runner of all time, Haile Gabri Selassie. Haile was from this area called Arsi, in particular the town of Asela. He was one out of ten children, and he would run ten kilometers a day to school, and ten back. And those of you who have seen him run, or even from this photograph can see, that his left arm is crooked against his body. And that could be a remnant from running with his books all this time. But the importance of this slide is in the quotation. And it's not my words, it's Haile's words. And he says beautifully, I've been running since I was four or five. For us, life was a kind of sport. And that is really going to be, in one sense, a summary of a lot of what I'm going to say. We did a number of field studies to try and document this notion of running to school, for example, the very active African way of life. And this big rock here is actually the Nandi rock, from where the term Nandi tribe comes from. And if you see the name of the school, it's called Pemja. And the motto of the school is that life is a struggle. And you can also see carefully seven kilometers away. The road takes you, a dirt road, and suddenly stops. And then you've got seven kilometers to climb. And it's not easy, as you will see shortly. Here on the, you can see this young pupil, running to school, using, interestingly, no shoes and with a four-foot strike. That may mean something to some of you. But if you look down here, you'll see these kids actually running down, holding in their hands water containers. Where are they going? They're going to fetch water from the stream, and they're going to run back up again. Some of them will run home to have some lunch, and actually even have to make it, and then run back. Then you'll note myself, sweating to try and get to the top, 
with my Kenyan research team, and they're also really struggling, as you can see here. But they, all, they are Kenyans. So we wanted, for the first time, is to measure the activity of these kids using an objective method. And that method is accelerometry. And as you can see, we keep research in the family here. This is Anthony again a few years ago, wearing an accelerometer on his hip, a heart rate monitor. And using that technology, we can objectively assess physical activity. And you can see in the different colors, we can look at yellow, which is light, orange, which is moderate, red, which is vigorous, during the day. And if you combine the moderate and the vigorous, the yellow, sorry, the orange and the red, you get MVPA, moderate to vigorous physical activity, which is the important physical activity for physical fitness determination. So my question was, what is the MVPA of these kids? And the answer is 140 minutes in the girls and 173 in the boys. Recommendations are, for general health, 60 minutes a day. These are very much higher. Very high activity. What about fitness? Will they also have a higher fitness? We can do that using a system like this, which is a portable gas analyzer. And we get these children, as you can see here, on a purpose-built track to run. The bicycle and the student is there for pacing. It gets faster, faster, faster. He's carrying the gas analysis on his back. And when they can't keep up to the faster pace, that is maximum oxygen uptake, or VO2 max. So the question is, how fit were these kids? Very. And you can see here the range, it's quite a range, but the girls 61.5 and the boys some 74. These are some of the highest values recorded, if not the highest recorded. But this, to really get the meaning of this data, we need to compare it to other sources. European data, and I was quite fortunate some years ago to be part of this project called the Edifix project, where we assessed the physical activity throughout a number of European countries. And you can see my team here working here in Cyprus. And the MVPA of the, of the kids throughout the European Union, in the countries we looked at, averaged between 20 and 40 minutes. Now compare that to what we had in Kenya. You can't compare. So what are the performance implications of this finding? And I think it's stated here quite nicely that the decline in physical activity is primarily responsible for the general demise in physical fitness. The decline in physical fitness has had a negative effect on sporting performance. And we could use any case study from the developed world to do this, but I'm going to choose Great Britain. Why? In the 80s, these three were dominated middle distance running. But if we look at the national records for Great Britain, and we got to remove Mo Farah only because he was born and grew up in Somalia in his early years, and we remove him from this table, and you look at the chronological times, you'll see that those records were broken even before I was born, 1965 right through to 1997. There weren't any new records. So clearly you can see the effect it's having on performance. So this issue of white men can't run, where is the scientific evidence? And I have to say, there isn't. So what I've tried to do today is demonstrate to you that the unique African way of life, our ancestral way of life, the way all of us would have lived, our ancestors would have lived 130,000 years ago, that primes those with the right genetics, however, and I'm stressing that, so this environment primes those with the right genetics to excel in distance running. And that's why this phenomenon will continue. Because the mismatch between our biology and our environment is getting bigger and bigger in the developed world. And this is a big problem. We know that half the population is living in cities. This is Tokyo, a photograph that I took. We know that by the year 2050, almost 90% of the developed world will be living in cities. And there's this mismatch between our bodies and the environment. So we have to do something. So what is the future? I think this is an important message worth sharing, is we have to think out of the box. This is a cartoon of out of the box. And I don't know what the solution is, but I'm excited about one possible solution 
or at least makes us think of out of the box, and that is parkour. And I'll let you just watch this for a moment. It really epitomizes this issue of matching the body to our environment, our changing environment. His aim is to get from A to B using the easiest, most efficient route, overcoming obstacles. While watching this, you may think this is only, you have to be super fit to do this. This is becoming so, so much more popular every day. Young children are doing this, elderly people are doing it, not to this extent, obviously. So which way would you want to commute back home? Taking the bus, the taxi, being in a queue? Or something like this? And in speaking to a few people today, I talked about parkour, and they said, what is that? And if, if you've been living in a bubble, you will not have heard of this. This advertising campaign was on the BBC One in 2002. It's becoming extremely, extremely popular. I'm not saying this is the solution, but what this beautifully shows is that we have to match our beautifully designed bodies to the environment. And it's easier to change the environment than it is our genetics. I hope I've convinced you, and with that I'll stop. Thank you very much.